Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Canis Albinas. Makalua. The main team. Mega Bears fan. So, we should be good. And that means it's my turn. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Polycast episode 396. This is Canis Albinus, and I am joined by the regular co host, Makalua. Almost to 400. What? The me and team. One step closer to 1,000. What? And Mega Bears fan. My Polycast resolution for 2022 will try to say less mild swears so that Canis doesn't have to feel obligated to uh, censor as much of the episodes. It's what, only what? been once in the entire last year, so... Was it? It feels like it was more. It was just once, and it was right at the end of last year. But, yep, New Year, we've been renewed for yet another year, which we should have said at the end of last episode, but hey, might as well say it now. Well, it makes for a more interesting cliffhanger. Are they coming back? Find out. Or don't. <laughs> <laughs> or don't, yeah. <sighs> well, eventually, absence of evidence would be evidence in its own right at some point. Yeah, I don't know how, I don't know if it would be possible to even stop doing it the, like this. I don't think I could, in good conscience, just end it that way. <laughs> just, like, say nothing and walk away all yeah. of us at once. I'm sure that one would, of us would at least say something. That would be really awkward. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I would probably say something. Like, i just put a post <laughs> on the form, like, it looks like we're not recording anymore, guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we all have Siphonetics accounts. Surely somebody will say something at some point. <laughs> some point, yeah, yeah, guys, we will at least try to, if we knew we were doing, we will at least try to have something neat for the end, not just, okay, bye. Well, speaking sort of of the end and news-related thing, uh, Anton Stranger, who was the Civ Six lead, has left for Axis. Uh, he'd been there for ten years. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, it's been a while. I said today was my last game at for Axis Games. It's been a thrilling ten years, and I've had the privilege of working on one of my favorite games with my favorite people. But Civ fans, you are the best fans in gaming. He uh, started out doing Beyond Earth. Actually, he was That's the lead, was... he was the lead designer for Beyond Earth. Yeah, that's what and I was thinking back to. His, that's when I first heard his name was at some point during that. And I think he wasn't the lead on Civ Six. He was the lead on the Civ Six DLC because Ed Beach was the leader on yeah. Civ Six. Right, which now makes me wonder who uh, is going to lead Civ Seven because typically the the way that it's worked in the past is you have a lead designer for the the vanilla base game, and then they bring in a new lead designer who does the expansions, and then is the lead designer for the next mainline game. So, what was it? Um, uh, John Schaefer was the lead designer for Civ Five Vanilla. Then Ed Beach came in for the Gods and Kings and Rise and Fall or uh, Brave New World expansions, and then Ed Beach continued on to do. Vanilla Civ Six, but Ed Beach is still with the company too. He didn't leave like uh, uh, John Schaefer did, or at least as far as I know, Ed Beach is still there. So I wonder if he's still going to be in charge when uh, Civ Seven eventually rolls around. That would be unprecedented because I don't think we've ever had a lead do two Civ games. Not even Brian Reynolds did that. I I mean I I wouldn't mind. I thought Civ Six's vanilla release was one of the best you know Civ Civilization vanilla releases uh, surely that I've played. Yeah, well, I mean, as a lead designer, I don't know that you you, you have some control over that. But when I think about the design of Civ so Six, um, it's pretty good. I, you know, I, I would put it second only to Four, and uh, it's I would put it far ahead of the other Civs. So I certainly wouldn't mind, uh, you know, if he built on what he's already done with Civ Six and came out with a even stronger Civ release. Now, that wouldn't to, bother me one bit. To be fair, a lot of that is because Civ Six built upon Civ V, like, probably a lot more than any Civ game has built upon its predecessor, except maybe, like, mm-hmm. you know, Civ Three building on Civ Two. I don't um, know, like, 2, 3, 4 had a lot of similarities, and they also diverged. I don't know that Civ Six is more similar to Five than, like, 3 was to 2, or 4 was to 3. Well, three but you're talking... Case, of- but there's a lot of unique design elements to Civ Six, and on top of that... Uh, he got rid of some of the worst stuff about uh, Civ Five, in my opinion. 
Uh, so at, at least in my book, he's done pretty well by the series. And my complaints with Civ Six are a lot more on just how the game plays in terms of controls and UI and you know performance type stuff. Yeah, but from a design up. perspective, um, I there's not a lot that I really hate about Civ Six. Like, yeah, uh, there's some things that maybe I'd prefer one way or another, but it, it's pretty good. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't mind seeing another like, good designer run it back. Right. A lot of our complaints tend to be about like efficiency of actions and stuff like that. Just, oh, the UI should do a better job of presenting this or we need, you know, to be able to do this in fewer clicks. And, uh, you know, oh, gosh, why to turn? Why does turn processing take so long? You know, stuff like that. Or just bugs. Yeah, those are annoying, too. But that's just part of the nature of the beast at this point. I just a, like to br- see them bring in a UI specialist for their their design that actually cares about economy of input. Supposedly they hired one, so maybe we'll see. One of the problems, though, is that a lot of the design considerations have to do with making something a UI that works on both PC with the mouse and keyboard, but also now on consoles with a gamepad controller and you know potentially also on touchpads with the you know touch inputs and it's it's not easy to make one ui that does all of those things well yeah although it should be easier for the computer than any of the others because you can implement just straight up have hotkeys for everything bindable like, and just let the player configure the, the controls out right because what's really challenging about the other devices is the limitations on the number of buttons you have and like how the screen is going to display and whatnot so like if you're building around that you can still let the pc people hit key sequences to do things very quickly uh, without having to like move the mouse around or spend a lot of time and the other thing is just the game optimization which i mean design is part of the game optimization it very much is because if you design like a thing that comes to mind is hearts of iron Hearts of Iron has all these units fighting each other, and it's doing checks on things every hour that barely make any difference than if you had done a check daily. So they're doing like 24 times the computations at like hundreds and hundreds of units uh, doing going against each other. And when you scale up 24 times a couple thousand, it's going to start to drag you. And I'm sure every game has some stuff like that. And the design is part of it. It's not all of it, but you can definitely get better optimization out of altering your design at the margins. We'll see. We've been talking a lot about Ed Beach, but we should be talking about Anton Stranger. Uh, do we know where he's going? I don't know. <clears throat> well, like, presumably he left for a reason, or, you know, maybe... <laughs> I thought he was not going to retire. I don't know, maybe. No, well, but it, it could be sort of like with what happens in other industries that you, he has to take a... Well, in racing, they call it a gardening leave. He may have to take off a few months before he's allowed to go work somewhere else. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I will definitely say about Anton Strenger that uh, Civ Six followed in the footsteps of its predecessor by uh, having some pretty darn good expansion packs. So uh, he and his team did a very good job, I think. Uh, there's some things in, in both Rise and Fall and Gathering Storm that I think, you know, should become mainstays of the series from here on out. So yeah, uh, good work. Well done. His last tweet was December twenty seventh, uh, December seventeenth, which was this announcement. So we don't know what he's doing yet. We, yeah. we definitely, he definitely had a nice Christmas vacation, at least. Yep. <laughs> but what I really enjoyed that he did was he was the guy behind Rising Tide's diplomacy system, which I really think should have been added to Civ Six instead of what we have. Oh yeah, I I am like dumbfounded that those ideas, uh, and and it's not even like that they changed it right that they did like an iteration of it like they just didn't even try it at all but it was it was one of those cases i guess where beyond earth didn't do so well so they threw out the baby with the bathwater when there were a lot of really good ideas those the dip- though the the fear and respect system was really good the the communiques were really good the war score system was pretty good well and the, the fear and respect system i also think would have uh, worked really well with the uh, agenda system for the leaders in um, in Civilization VI because you think of like someone like uh, like Harold of Norway who like likes you if you're building a big navy and then it has those those weirdness things where yeah I'm building a big navy so that I can invade <laughs> uh, Norway uh, like that would make a lot more sense if it was like he 
respects allies who have big navies and fears enemies who have big navies because then he would actually respond appropriately to whether you know you're going to use that navy to help him or that navy is a threat instead of it just being like hey i'm building a massive amphibious invasion force to attack norway and like suddenly he wants to be friends yeah or he attacks me i build a big navy to counter him and then at the end of the war suddenly he's talking about how wonderful my navy is and that he wants to be friends and it's like dude oh what the hell's wrong with you i'm killing you well, you could you could put that as him begging for his life too. In that case, though. I mean, I, I suppose, yeah. If you want to like project, you know, emergent narrative onto the uh, <laughs> underlying systems, that's one way to look at it. Well, that's the best way to have emergent narrative, though, is when the systems create that kind of experience without having to be told how to do it. Right, and Beyond Earth Rising Tide did it. You know, its its biggest fault with the leaders and the diplomacy was that the leaders themselves were so, you know, cookie cutter, cardboard cutout bland. Uh, and with had exactly like, one voice line. Yeah, I was going to say two, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, no village was ever ruined by trade. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Tell me more about Adam Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a shame because I really like Adam Smith, but turned him into a meme. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the biggest shame in in Beyond Earth not doing well was the diplomacy system got left behind. But and there were other interesting ideas too, like the the mobile aquatic cities, you know, like you, you could have iterated upon that and like done that as like special abilities for some of the civilizations that had more nomadic lifestyles. Like I could have seen something like that working for the Huns or the Mongols or, mm. you know, maybe the, the Scythians, if the Scythians I think were also a, a nomadic or pastoralist culture, uh, you know, except obviously on land, not on sea. Yeah, I was going to say, I the system like that where you do a, a project in the city to move the city and, you know, th- th- like tying that into a national ability for some of those civs. Like, I, I could have totally seen something like that, uh, Bennett being a good, you know, ability for some of those civs and just, nope, completely dropped. I feel like that would be kind of a handicap, though, because once you have more than one city, how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, it would need, like I said, it would uh, be an iterative thing you know they'd Need obviously to want it. to yeah they'd want to tweak some of the things because there's a lot more com- competition for uh for real estate on land than there was on the sea in uh in rising tide for sure but like i could totally see like you know hey this river keeps flooding let's like not be settled next to this river anymore <laughs> you know M- move away but anyway we will miss anton stranger he was a good guy i met him once at uh for Axicon. seemed like and he knew kn- what he was talking about and who knows, maybe he'll he'll start a new company or go to a new company that will, you know, do another uh, Forex uh, historic strategy game. And we'll have yet more competition in this uh, emerging renaissance of uh, turn-based Forex games. Historical ones, at least. topic what you want to keep lingering on this one not really we finished it didn't we well then we will linger on the next one which is lingering questions this one is by starts by shaka khan and it's a uh, quite a long list of questions about specific mechanics in the game um i could go over them line item by line item uh, one of the posters later in the thread actually answered most of the questions uh most of them with confidence some with uh, a little bit of uncertainty uh, rls uh, answered most of these yeah, some of these are, are pretty easy to answer. Like the you know, original poster could have answered some of them by just saving the game, testing it, and then reloading it if it didn't work the way he wanted it to work. Yeah, that's true. And that's often a good way to experiment in games in general, as long as they allow it. Yeah, some are a little bit better about that than others. Looking at you, Dominions 5. Yeah, n- n- never learn a new game in Iron Man mode. Like, you're just... <laughs> you're you not going to have a good time. Five. You, have to, like, you basically have to save swap your save folder to reload a save yeah that's that's just ridiculous. Save reload. I, I like that at least that complex that is awful yeah i like that at least the pa- the paradox games expect you to play in iron man mode like they lock all their achievements and everything behind it but at least they give you the option to turn it off so that you can learn the darn game yeah and well it, it's really not a good anti-cheat at all so I, i'm not, i'm not really a fan of the design of iron man mode in games generally 
Because well, even in Paradox games, like you can save, uh, you can save a file outside of the folder and just put it back in, and you load an old save. Well, and at the end of the day, like it's a single player game. Who cares if yeah. players are cheating in single player? Like, I don't, I don't even think it has a leaderboard or anything like that. So, like, oh, you know, they made one once and it, it immediately got compromised, and somebody had like an impossible score within like a day or two, and they turned into a complete meme and they dropped it. <laughs> but they did try. They tried that. <laughs> anyway, questions about Civ Six. <laughs> okay, so for uh, free units, uh, they are not free for maintenance or resource uh, consumption. So, like, if you get something from settling a foreign continent city with England or whatever, you still have to you still have to upkeep it. You, it's just free up front, uh, so to speak. Uh, I, I was see. under the impression that you that they did not consume resources if they were marked as free. Ah, he's saying gold and strategic maintenance. Huh. Uh, is, I, I'm presuming that Arlesk has either experienced these directly or tested them as a result of the opening post. Well, darn, I might have some strategy guides on my blog that I might have to go back and revise in that case. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say for sure that everything said here is necessarily 100% accurate. because It's not like I've tested it myself recently. Uh, so this is with a grain of salt, but you know, these questions are mostly answered. Um if you settle on resources, do you get the the plus two for uh, mines? And the answer is yes. So you can, uh, you can as, still play in the city. As far as I know, in Civ Six, if you settle directly on a resource, you get all of the benefits of improving that resource, except for the improved yield of the improvement itself. Yeah. You get the base yield of the resource, but not the yield of the improvement. No matter yeah. whether it's the strategic or luxury or bonus or anything. Well, you know, if it's a harvestable resource, it destroys it. But I think the game warns you about that too. Uh, so it does. You get a when there is an exception, it does let you know. One example of very good UI design. Yes. Yes. Hey, tell me how the actual rules work before I do the thing, and that way I don't have to save scum. This is a lot of questions about England. My goodness. Yeah. Well, I'm sure this poster is playing an England game, and so it has questions that are general, and then then questions beyond that that are specific uh, to england i'm not sure he's uh, do you, english teams or water parks get a bonus when powered that's what he's asking it's a long way to get to that uh, the uh rls wasn't sure i've not played england in so long <laughs> so i don't know that offhand you uh oh yeah for coupe if you spend a lot of time twiddling your thumbs uh <laughs> your science stockpile so to speak but I, I will put a caveat for that, uh, because even though it's technically true, uh, you know, all, a lot of the production and everything you would have done, like, yeah, and the other progress you would make from settling and getting tile improvements and stuff sooner, like, there's still a huge opportunity cost to taking ages on that. So you don't want to linger too long unless you're doing the uh, spiffing Brit, don't settle a city, uh, city victory or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you get you get some <laughs> accrued benefit, I guess. Yeah, with oh. Coupe, I believe it works the same as if you were to like not select a new tech or civic and then just shift enter to end the turn for several turns. It, it'll all carry over for when you do finally actually select something. Oh, I saw a video by Civ Lifer over the break uh, about always shift entering on culture because then you can switch your civics whenever. And there's a few other benefits to it on top of that. I found that fascinating. It'd be kind oh, yeah. of annoying, though, to do that every turn. but I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that that could be a a good way to uh, change your civics or government whenever you want to. Yeah. I mean, that has uh, a lot of potential benefit because there's some policy cards that are only very useful for a brief moment, right? When you're building a unit or like yeah. you get builder charges, right? As you complete the builder, so right? You can like make the builder for eight turns and then I turn switch in that policy and complete the builder and then like switch back to something else more useful. Or like the um, discount on like buying tiles, you know, save up the gold, slot that in for one turn, buy everything in one turn, and then slot. In fact, you don't even need to roll over the turn in that case. Like you could hypothetically go in and change that before the turn's even over and uh, still have received the benefits of it. I don't think yeah. you can do that, can you? I don't think you can switch multiple times in one turn, but you can switch it for the turn you buy and then on the next turn, switch it again. Uh, even if you even if you purchase the ability to change your civics, you can you not do that on the same turn? Oh, I haven't tried it that way. Is I've never valued buying tiles to that extent. 
Like usually if I'm <laughs> buying a tile, it's something that's really important that I get it right now, like a strategic resource so I can start building swordsmen to attack the target or something. Like It would seem kind of silly with that one because unless you were planning on build, buying like a huge amount of tiles in one turn and you'd saved up for it. Yeah, I've never that's never been a thing for me personally. I, I think if you if you uh do manage to complete a civic during the turn, like either by getting culture from some other source or uh performing the like inspiration or whatever for a civic that was already like halfway researched, I think that does unlock the ability to change your civics, even if you had already changed them at the start of the turn. But I, I could be wrong, but I think I've had that happen before. Very, very rarely. So it might be possible. Okay, moving on. Uh, Eleanor's Court of Love is uh, 10 tiles from the city center, even if it says 9 in the ability, and all the great works work for it. Uh, products, too. Products. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what they're going for with the Saladin thing. Well, what was the question? You don't get any bonuses for cities and other civilizations having your workshop or your worship building, right? Oh, right. It means he's basically asking... If you build, a, if you have a civilization in your religion and they build a church, and church is your building, do you get a bonus from them having built a church? Okay, so they don't get the ten percent modifier, but uh, you get, they get your they get the worship building otherwise. Yeah. All right. Uh, Biospheres just negate the appeal uh, for Martian rainforests, or the minus one that those get. So you get plus one relative to whatever it is previously for each of those types of tiles. Um, Colosseum doesn't work with range extenders? Although, I'm not assured of that one, because that was the case a while back. It has not tested it recently. Great Zimbabwe, every bonus resource within the three tiles of the city. Doesn't even need to be improved. And duplicates as well. Yeah. That's why Great Zimbabwe is so powerful. (laughs) What are its build requirements again? I think it needs Uh, to be on a floodplain... I think just next to a river next and to a, river. a uh, pasture. Or maybe specifically cattle. Hmm. I'm looking it up. To the wiki. <laughs> Must be built adjacent to cattle on and a commercial hub with a market. And the city mu- that builds the wonder must own the commercial hub. Oh, I thought there was a river requirement too. I guess I I'm did wrong. too. So It was commercial hub. It's guess- one of the ones that AI yeah, struggles to get. So you can actually get it. I think it's because I almost always build my commercial hubs on rivers that I thought the uh, Great Zimbabwe also had to be on a river. Apparently you can uh, check out your unit abilities by hovering in the pointer over the combat strength. So yes, you can. can. And it's uh, and it's all their abilities, not just their promotions. Yeah, so you can check if you're getting extra stuff. Yeah, it includes things like experience modifiers from uh, uh, encampment buildings and stuff like that, too. Yeah, I mean, I check that all the time because I'm looking for... Uh, things like great general bonuses to confirm that type of thing. Because stacking fixed or flat strength bonuses is a huge deal in combat, so it's one of my... I didn't realize the thing about the Zanye uh, Dantia. That's pretty cool. Thing about it? Oh, uh, if multiple cities each have one of the three tiles, you can get extra great people points, yeah. Depending on what it is, that's more or less practical. Depends. Uh. And stadiums and aquatic centers get plus two from power, not just plus one. So the total is plus three. Yeah, wording of that could be better. It should yeah. say, like, uh, improves to plus two or something like that. Or improves to plus three. Yeah. Man, who bothers with the amenities to keep their people happy? That's just silly. <laughs> I was going to say, it makes sense in a real-life perspective because you get more use out of a stadium or an aquatic center, you know, if you can use it at night when it's lit up. Size it's four big to enough seven, it needs city light. spam, go. That's the way. And then the electronics factory, what was the question about that? Do all cities within six tiles get plus four culture or just the parent city? Just the parent city. This is for Japan specifically, the electronics yeah. factory. So a good set of question and answer that got taken care of pretty quickly. Yeah, I learned yeah. a few things going through this. No, the... to... Go ahead. <laughs> it was good to know with Coupe because I, as much as I've actually played them, I don't think I had known or noticed that it didn't matter if I forgot to select the uh, tech initially. Because sometimes when I've got Coupe and multiplayer, I'm too busy trying to move around. And went, oh, I'm like, oh, no, I didn't select a tech. But it's good to know it was banked the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to say. It's been the case in Civ. Even like back in the Civ 4 days, you, if you like accrued research without picking something, it would still 
Well, Civ 4 would nag you with a pop-up until you picked something. I didn't think it was possible to not pick something in Civ 4. I think there were some edge cases. Because not every Civ game has had the shift-enter uh, ability to just end the turn. Yeah, oh, I, I was thinking of Overflow, actually. Yeah, and then there's also multiplayer, where if it's on a timer, it's going to roll over whether you're ready or not. Oh, yeah, that's uh, true. Ah, yes, that too, yeah. And you don't lose the science then in yeah. Civ 4. Although it might go to something you don't want. Anyway, yeah, I always do find the... Um, uh, stuff about like the ranges of certain buildings uh, being a little bit confusing. Like I'm always unclear on like for an industrial hub, does it give the bonus to city centers within that range? Or what if I put the other cities industrial hub in that range? Do they like buff each other? Uh, that was always something that uh, kind of confused me. Or, or does the, the, is the source of the range, the district or the city center? That was that's something that also I was never really sure about. Looks like it's the city center. I don't know. I've always been counting from the district because I've always assumed it was the the district is the the source of the range. But I don't know. Maybe I've been wrong all this time. That would make sense, but who knows? I don't know. Well, it's also how it's like worded in the you know text descriptions and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, should I be counting six tiles from my industrial hub or six tiles from the city center? I'm assuming it's the industrial hub. It should be the hub. That's where you're building the stuff. That's where the stuff is going. And that's where your presumptive production center is. That's the whole point of having it built that way on the map. I'm not saying that's how it does work, but that's how it should work. <laughs> Those two things do not always align. Thinking of you again, Hearts of Iron, Paradropper range. Uh-huh. Hearts of Iron is just a broken game. It is. But then it becomes an excellent reference material for giving examples of when something is broken. Yep. Well, pivoting from learning about Civ, let's talk about learning with Civ. There is an article in PC Games N uh, titled, This U.S. Teacher Uses Humankind and Civilization to Teach World History. And uh, this is another example of, I believe it was a high school teacher. Yes, high school teacher in uh, Maine in the United States who basically lets his history students uh, play Civ and or humankind as a uh, way of hopefully teaching them about history. I want to see people use Crusader Kings to teach about the medieval period. Oh, that would no. Be very amusing. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, the article says that there is both like a traditional history class and also one that uses games uh, as the uh, teaching aids. I'm unclear if they're like the same class or if they're actually like different classes. I think, it sounds like they're different classes. I think they're different classes at the same class level. So they're both yeah. like history eight or something like that. And uh, apparently uh, after, you know, students and faculty started like, you know, tweeting about it and sharing this on social media, uh, both Firaxis and Amplitude's uh, social media teams reached out and provided free copies of the game uh, for the classrooms. So that's always nice. And they didn't say anything about it to the media, which makes me happy. Yeah, so it wasn't just a big publicity stunt. It was just like, oh, that's cool. You're uh, exposing our games to these kids and using it as a teaching tool here. Have some free copies. Maybe, hopefully, some of these kids will buy a copy for themselves when they to play at home. And uh, hopefully, they also learn a thing or two. Now, I doubt we'll see it here, but I wonder what the objective performance metrics look like between the two uh, approaches. Because uh, this teacher teaches both ways. He also has a traditional class. So I'm curious how much meaningful difference there is between either approach uh, when well, it comes and, time to perform on a test. And I, I get the impression from skimming through this article that the, the teacher is also teaching in the class that plays uh, the game. Oh, games. of course. So it's, it's not, yeah, it's not just like all the students are coming into a big computer lab and just booting up a game for, you know, 60 minutes or, or however the heck... Uh, long the classes and actually thinking about that now like as an avid one more turner like that's kind of a nightmare the idea of oh my gosh when the bell rings i can't do one more turn it yeah. says here uh, we this the this class tends to attract kids that hate school and are looking for an easy grade but what i find is that the kids work harder and care more than their traditional learning counterparts their test scores being pretty end up being pretty similar to high achieving students taking the traditional class, even though they take the same tests. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. And mm -hmm. I think there was a question in here where they asked the teacher which of the two games uh, 
he prefers, and he gives kind of like a, you know, both have their ups and downs. Uh, he says <laughs> civilization is simpler and more intuitive. Uh, having played humankind, I can definitely say, yes, that is the case. Uh, but then he also says that he likes that humankind actually starts with the nomadic Neolithic era, you know, before the invention of agriculture and settling down into cities, uh, which is a useful uh, learning tool because that is a major topic of the classes is the pre-agriculture, you know, development into, you know, civilizations. He also says that he's probably going to use Civ Six primarily going forward, but that's not because he doesn't like humankind. He just found it easier to teach using it, apparently. Easier on the newbies. Man, this is where we need Dan here to talk about the time he did that with his own classes. I did invite him, but he was busy with his own issue. Yeah. Are we allowed to say what it is officially? I don't think we are. <laughs> if you're at, you mean, like, do you have permission from Dan? or? That's what I mean, yeah. I haven't heard either way. I don't even know what you're re- referencing. So I, I will tell you after the show. to do that live. Yeah, I will tell you after the show. Okay. And w- with regard to using civilization as a teaching tool, I, I will say uh, that even though it's not very great at teaching these, even though it's not very great at teaching the specifics of history, you know, outside of like the Civilopedia, I do think it is a, a very good tool for teaching like some of the, the patterns of history you know, some of the hows and whys some things have happened historically. It's really good at showing you a plausible reason why a path went the way it did. It's not it's not good on a specifics level at all. It's actually really bad specifically, but it it's the gateway drug. It gives you something to see and look at that's pretty and says, hey, this looks like it might actually be fun to learn about instead of just oh, look, a bunch of dates and ni- names on a page that are telling me all this stuff I don't care about. I'm sure you can yeah, get some like leverage out of uh, talking about agendas and stuff, too, like and why the designers picked an, a given agenda for a leader and to what extent it's appropriate, that sort of thing, because it gives some context uh, to the leader and how the leader actually behaved in history. Yeah. <laughs> and you can even compare how closely different leaders match their uh, historical counterparts in civilization, because some are certainly closer than others. And sometimes when you study history, why did they go to war over this small issue? But then you experience something like that in the game, like you were going to settle somewhere and you were trying to get a resource and somebody else came and got it. You're like, oh, now this is war. Oh, suddenly I understand why this happens. Yeah, you need that resource. <laughs> yeah, so there was yeah. a legit reason you needed that resource and somebody took it. Like, oh, no, you didn't. One of the things that Civ taught me when I was very young was, oh, so this is why people, liter- why in the 1700s, Europeans literally lost hundreds of thousands of lives rather than eat food without pepper on it anymore. Because there literally was a war that was fought over access to pepper, and a lot yeah, of people had, died in it. I had a, uh, I had a high school history teacher who, like, one of the very first lectures uh, of the class, he uh, started talking about, uh, you know, this was back in the days where Civ 3 was the most recent Civ game available. Uh, but he, he used Civ 3. He, he didn't play the game in class, but he talked about it and said, well, how do you, uh, where do you put cities? Uh, and then if, you, if you're playing Civilization, you know, Civ 3, you should know that when you found your city, you're looking for fresh water, you're looking for resources, you know, stuff like that. That was how uh, that was how he taught uh, where cities are usually placed in real life. It's probably hard to explain that to the kids in Las Vegas, though. <laughs> yeah. What's a river? Why are we out here in the middle of a desert? Some gangsters wanted to make some money. You had to uh, settle that city later when technology was better. Yeah. Yeah, it's nothing an aqueduct won't fix, right? Exactly. Well, yeah, but they had to build a dam first. Well, I, that means there's water nearby, and the, this, you know, my understanding is that the city was, uh, you know, settled as, you know, in order to build the dam. Was it Las Vegas? Possible. Yeah, you like can... I, I, I want to say that the the origin of Las Vegas is as like a worker city for the people who were building the Hoover Dam. Yeah, and they couldn't build right next to it because I've seen what the real life terrain looks around that. It's like while in a fantasy game that would make an amazing city in real life. Oh no. <laughs> I mean, there, there were there were settlements there. Like we have like the old Mormon fort that's you know from uh-huh. like the seventeen or eighteen hundreds or whatever. 
Uh, and then I'm sure there were probably like mining communities or maybe there were ranchers or whatever in, in the area. Uh, cause there is a, uh, a, a, like swampy marshland, uh, in the, within the valley. So, you know, there might've been some usable water there. I don't know. Las Vegas was built in 1905 or founded in 1905 on land adjacent to the Union Pacific Railroad, uh, incorporated as a city in 1911. Um, it became a fairly large city in 1931 after Nevada legalized casino gambling and reduced residency requirements for divorce. And then at the same time, Hoover Dam was also being built. Oh, okay. So the casinos did precede the dam. All right. Well, I learned something no, about the city I live the in. They happened the same year. Oh, exactly the same year. Okay. Yeah. That and the and, <clears throat> and simple divorces. Well, not necessarily simple, but reduced yeah, residency. But, yeah. Get married and divorced in the same day. Well, it can. was it was more like in other parts of the country you had to like like there were still divorce ro- rules where along the lines of you have to show just cause why this marriage should end and their owner options were onerous for women trying to get away from abusive men so women would move to las vegas and live there for six weeks and then get divorced yeah and i don't think you know irreconcilable differences was on the forms at that time no or a no-fault divorce either Who's next? I think it's me. It is me. We'll move into the Senate. And this thread is called Daftist Messages. But the actual topic I want to discuss, well, that's, that's made by Miserable Old Git. I think that's the name. And he mentions, my own favorite is when civs say you are heading to bankruptcy while you have six-figure bank and four figures per turn income. But the real important topic we wanted to talk about here was came up a little bit later, where they're talking about whether or not the agenda system itself is a failure as a system. Well, uh, we kind of already touched on that a little bit earlier, talking yeah, about we how did. Uh, I think the, the fear and respect system from Rising Tide would have made it a lot better. Yeah, it is true that uh, the agenda system does cause some weird things, like if Cleopatra is paranoid... It becomes a problem because she loves you for having a huge military and hates you for having a huge military. Or if you are um, dealing with a Congo that is a zealot, it's also a problem. Yeah, so so to be clear, you know, one of the things to, to make apparent about the agenda system is that there are the leader-specific agendas, right, which each leader has, but then there's also, like, the one or two random agendas that the AIs are assigned in addition to, you know, the preset leader agenda. I think and it's just one. Yeah, I, I think at one point in the game it might have been two. Like, there was one that was unlocked early in the game and one that stayed hidden until, like, the modern era or something when you had, like, spies and embassies or whatever was that um, a gender or just if you pick an ideology i don't remember maybe uh but anyway sometimes those are in conflict and that leads to really 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 weird and silly behavior yeah, i think this is more of an implementation problem than a conceptual design problem right like agendas especially if they were given more like the beyond earth example in addition to them like working with that uh could be really good but yeah it's they definitely need a sanity check because right now there are some interactions that are just nonsense. Yeah. And the, you know, the, the idea behind the system originally is as far as I, you know, can conjecture, because obviously I don't work at Fraxis. I don't know what the heck their internal meetings were, were saying was the reason for this, but the, the idea behind it seems to be to be, to make the, the AIs play the civilization you know, their specific civilization better by giving them, you know, AI agendas that make them want to use their unique abilities and unique units and infrastructure and stuff like that, as opposed to just having vague flavors, as in the previous games, where maybe they use their stuff if, you know, the the flavor roles come up correctly, maybe they don't. It's a way of ensuring that, oh, hey, this civilization has all their uh, unique centered around building a mounted, you know, horse army. So let's give them a, an agenda that specifically hard codes them to build horse units. So they'll actually use the darn things. 
instead of, you know, having just some, you know, semi random flavor things where maybe they build their entire army around archers instead and then never use any of their abilities throughout the game. Uh, the um, alternate example we are given in the thread is the Civ 5 and Civ 4 um, personality value um, defines flavor scores, I think they called them. Oh which, yeah, they had weights in uh, Civ 4, like yeah, I, yeah unit prop. And it's, and it's the same thing in Civ 5, it's just called something different, I think. And I don't know for sure that there's not still weights like that operating in the background in addition to the agendas. There could very well be. There probably should be if there aren't, because if they are literally all identical with just a few um, agendas, then that doesn't seem like it would produce good results. But then again... The diplomacy in Civ Six is probably the weakest part of the game. I feel like diplomacy is always the weakest part of every Civ game, to be honest. It was a lot more robust in Civ Three and Civ Four. Yeah, yeah in Civ probably Civ... its peak, but it, those were they also were still outclassed by alternative games. Yeah. yeah, like they were better in those games, but still one of the weakest aspects of those respective games. I still but love yeah, like, love doing the trade deals where you get Sid Meier up in the corner telling you they will probably be insulted by this deal. Yeah, but yeah, there, there's definitely merit like to the idea of these agendas. And it, it's another thing like the fear and respect system of uh, Rising Tide that I hope the negative fan reaction to it doesn't lead them to just abandon it wholesale, right? Like it, it's something that I feel could definitely use in at least one more game of like iteration to try to get it working the way that they, you know, expected it to work on paper. There's always next game and we know what's coming finally, so. Yeah, and uh I will also like to say that I don't think I've ever seen that bankruptcy diplomatic message ever at a time when I'm actually losing money in the game. Like it, it always is when I have like 800 gold in my stockpile and I'm making like 60 per turn. Yeah. It, it it usually does come like right after I made a large purchase. So like the previous turn, I had like two thousand gold, and now I only have eight hundred. And they're like, "Oh my gosh, if you spend that much again, I guess you're going to go bankrupt." But like, I'm okay. I'm not going to spend it all again. <laughs> you're supposed to spend your money. That means you're using your resources. Yeah, exactly. I, money, anything, doesn't, they, money doesn't do you any good if it's just sitting in your coffers. Yeah, it's it, just a, a bad algorithm for one to display that. It's funny though. Well, unless uh, Civ had a mechanic where you actually get interest on your treasury, but that's a a different topic. But yeah, uh, if anything, there should be a message that the AI should give to you when you're hoarding money and be like, come on, bro. Why are you why are you being so stingy? Spend some of that. Warlords 2 did that. It was funny because that game was like very early 90s and the game would call you out if you had a ton of gold in the bank. (laughs) The guy's head would pop up and it would say something about uh, storing it all. There's a bit of a trade-off there because um, you could get heroes offered for huge sums of money. and uh, But then if you were storing it, then you weren't gaining the ability to build certain units and cities because that's where you also would invest it. So they actually did have a trade-off on storing money versus not. It wasn't compounding interest like in Heroes of Might and Magic 3 or something or 2 or wherever they had that building. I think it was in both for one of the factions. Yeah, one what, what of the complaints that I'm seeing uh, in this particular thread regarding the agenda system is how because each AI leader has one set agenda, they play much more similarly from game to game compared to previous versions of Civ where they would have those semi-random flavors that would uh, cause them to have different weights for different aspects of play in previous games. But mm. also... Like you, you got to take the design of the whole game into consideration too, because when you when you look at say Civ Four, uh, for example, you know the leaders didn't have unique abilities, right? The way that they do now, they had you know two, uh, you know like canned abilities from a set of like a dozen or so, you know, different abilities, and all the leaders just had a permutation. A unique permutation of two of those. So they didn't have like unique specific abilities to exploit. They had well, you more... did. You still had unique units and buildings. And for some civs, they weren't a big deal. For other civs, they were defining properties of the civilization. Well, true, right? And ideally, they should play to those strengths. But th- there's a lot more specific abilities in Civ Five and Civ Six than there were in previous games. And I think before Civ Four, there weren't like personality differences between the civs or leaders at all, but I never played them. So I don't know. 
was certainly less pronounced. So, so because those abilities and uniques were a little more vague and a little less specific, and even in the case of the units and buildings, they're a lot more era specific, right? Because that that unit only has a very narrow window of opportunity in which it's useful, uh, you know, and that might vary from civ to civ based on when it becomes a, how early it becomes available. Uh, so having more vague personality scores makes more sense in that context because you have more vague uh, abilities, you know, more interchangeable abilities. Whereas in Civ 5 and Civ 6, they have that one specific unique ability. And if they don't play towards whatever strengths that gives them, they're probably not going to perform well. So you do have to have a way to ensure that they're going to use that ability, you know, uh, ideally to its maximum potential, but obviously it's an AI, so it's never going to be you know, max potential, but hopefully at least competently. Competent AI, LOL. It's not happening until they do machine learning and then it's too strong for anyone. I don't think there's much in between. Well, even with machine learning, you can still have difficulty levels. You just set up the algorithm so that it makes less optimal decisions. Yeah, I mean, they already did that, so that's true. All right, building power tiers or buildings worth powering tier list. This started by Mango201 on Civ Fanatics. And the, the question is, of the buildings that can be powered, specifically the factory, stadium, aquatic center, research lab, broadcast center, shopping mall, airport, food market, and stock exchange, which ones do they, are they, or where do they fall on the S through F tier list? He lists factory as S because it gives you two power for 15 production if you're boosting five cities with proper alignment. And then uh, he says at the A tier is the Stadium and Aquatic Center, because if you set it up right, you can boost five cities and produce Coliseum-level amenity boosts in all of those cities. The Research Lab and the Broadcast Center set in rank B, because one power equals 1.66 science and 1.33 culture. The shopping mall is tier three, tier C. One power equals two gold and one amenity. The airport is ranked in D. Powered one power equals two production. Bonus XP is okay, but high production cost means you're usually prioritized pumping out aircraft before anti-air shows up. Food market and stock exchange are marked as rank F because one power equals two food or one power equals two point three three gold. Discuss. Man, air power before anti air shows up, huh? <laughs> I mean, it, you can against the AI for sure, but. Well, remember, the uh, for a long time in Civ 6, the AI had a problem where I, I don't think they ever bothered to build AA. Well, they didn't build air either. <laughs> yeah, well. At that point, they, they did neither of those things. So you didn't really have to worry about racing to uh, beat the AI's production on either front at that point. I think the shopping mall is a little bit undervalued here because not because the plus two gold, but the amenity. Well, I, I think um, when you, he's uh, comparing it against the, the the higher amount of amenity you're getting theoretically with the stadium and aquatic center, that it falls short. Well, yeah. a, a big part of this is that all of the top tier buildings are things that have that range effect where they give their bonuses to other nearby cities. And the lower tier ones are the ones that just buff themselves. Yeah. With science being the highest, because it's just such an important thing to increase. Yeah, yeah, so the factory isn't just giving bonus production to itself when it's powered. It's also potentially projecting that bonus to, you know, multiple nearby cities. Yeah, factories are really good once you have them. Yeah, I was just thinking it was probably at least may, maybe the B, because it's gold plus the amenity as opposed to a C tier. Though I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it needs to be moved up much more, though. Well, the thing about amenities is it is one of the best ways to get those um, ecstatic benefits. They get mm. yield bonuses as you get higher and higher in the, in the amenity happiness levels. Yeah, yeah, didn't Firaxis, though, make it so that it's harder to get up into those higher levels? And there's like less, like, you get less benefit from discrete increases. Like, you have to go up like two levels of happiness or something before you get any bonuses. So in that sense, like amenity is not quite as valuable because if you're, if you're not going to get enough to push you over that threshold where you get more benefits, it really doesn't do anything at all. And amenity is one of those things where typically you either already have a lot of it or you don't have enough and you're just, you know, getting enough to scrape by and not have unhappiness in your cities. 
I mean, the way to go is just to be the man who arranges the tanks with factories, and then you go get more amenities, and then you're fine. But I, I think a big part of why the shopping mall uh, slips is that, like, at that point in the game, like, two gold is nothing. I mean... Malls are so 1990s. Get that crap out of here. <laughs> like, if, if the mall were giving you, like, a meaningful amount of gold, like, if it were giving you 20 gold or something like that, then, you know, maybe. But, yeah, like, that late in the game, two gold is just not worth a whole lot. Because even buying the cheapest units at that point in the game cost, like, 2,000 gold. And the upkeep is, like, six gold, usually. Yeah, like, that's not even paying for the upkeep of one unit, either, if you do buy one. And then same goes for the stock exchange way down there in tier F. Like, again, you know, that that comes in a little bit earlier, I think, than the shopping mall, but still like late enough in the game where like a single trade route is giving you like 50 gold. So gaining another two and a third gold is, uh, you know, it, it's not making the difference between you winning and losing the game for sure. No, nope, you do all your trade routes internally from one city. Or to one city, and you just put your factory there and max out production, and you just hammer out armies. And even uh, then, like, you're even then you're better off going with uh, what the social policy that just gives you like plus two gold from every trade route, and then you're getting as much or more than you were making from the shopping mall or the stock exchange, even with a completely mercantile economy. <laughs> that's true. I mean, you could buy armies too, but it's easier to hammer them out my experience by late game because you just have so much production and you're, you're near good cities you're a couple good cities can just crank them well and if you're playing very well you don't even have to be building units at that time because hopefully your units from earlier in the game have survived long enough to all just be upgraded and you have a large enough army to do what you need anyway that's true but if you're trying to roll the world you often are opening up more fronts simultaneously rather than like finishing one first and then going to the next and then yeah, the and, and you're going to want to build, you know, your airplanes and, and stuff like that as well, which, you know, obviously aren't being upgraded from older units. Yeah. Um, we got to remember the airport does allow the airlift land unit option. Yeah, but you, it doesn't have to be powered to do that, right? You just I think you just need a specific tech to just unlock need the that. tech. Yeah. Well, you need yeah, it's it's a um, a civic, I think civic, it's yeah. like mobilization or something like rapid that. deployment, it says here. Yeah, there you go. Now, if that were something, you usually don't care because you like your roads slash railroads actually contribute a lot of movement, and you have so many social policies that improve your movement. Like you get the plus one from starting in friendly territory, you get another plus one, another plus. Like it's not uncommon to have four to five speed move infantry by then, and if you're stacking that with railroads, the airlift might be faster, but it usually isn't that much. I mean, maybe if the map is enormous. It's really also helpful if you have like settlements on multiple continents or land masses where instead of having to spend a turn embarking and disembarking, you just, you know, airlift them across the ocean. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Normally, uh, like build an army and then commit it, though, rather than like try to reinforce a new continent by streaming airlifted units. Yes, but not but everybody's as good as you. I guess if you had losses you. or something, that would be the way to reinforce well, depending on when you conquered or settled those cities on the other continents, they might not be productive enough to uh, build armies. So you're still building your units in your core cities and then having to ship them overseas one way or another. Yeah, but presumably whatever lets you take the cities there is still there if you need them there. <laughs> yeah, if you conquered them. If you settled them, then not necessarily. Oh, I guess. Who does that? But then again, in Settling order... cities late, <laughs> lol. Just in conquer. order to... Um, in order to send a unit with an airlift, I think it has to go from an airport to an airport, right? So you would still need to have a city at the destination with an airport, which is, you know, not going to be a trivial thing to do if you're just settling cities late in the game on other continents. Yeah. And if you're conquering cities on other continents, like if the uh, AI hadn't already, or the other player hadn't already built a aerodrome, like uh, especially against the AI with how densely they pack their cities, there might not be any room for you to build one. I was never a fan of bothering with the airlifts in the Civ games, even in Civ 4. Some people really valued it, but I never did. I would just ship things on boats. Well, in Civ 4, I think you could airlift entire stacks, right? No. Um, it was one per city per turn. So you'd oh, have to like, produce a unit in that city and then like airlift it to another city. I don't think the target city needed the airport either. Uh, so like, I understand why people liked it so much. But from my experience... If you just waypoint your units to a coastal city with a bunch of boats, then usually within one or two turns, you could move the entire stack into another coastal city and 
because they the land units themselves didn't move, as long as you disembark, they could move immediately on landing, which is not true with airlifting. That actually uses the land units turn. So you have like a bit of a lag, like a two to three turn lag, but you're moving entire stacks at once rather than one unit at a time to cities. And uh, it, it's it's much more user input efficient to use boats. And it's not that much faster in game terms to airlift in most cases. So I would just use boats. And I think, in, I think in Civ 6, uh, you're also limited to one unit per airport being airlifted. I could be wrong about that, but I, I think you're still limited. So it, it's also something that's very slow to do because you have to do it one unit at a time each turn. You can't send your entire army. Actually, that's less of a problem in Civ 6 when your front line, like, because you can combine units into an army. So, like, if your front is, like, six units or seven units or whatever against the AI, which is totally realistic. Yeah, you don't have a stack of 20 units. <laughs> then, you yeah, airlifting, form. like, two or three turns is a substantial portion of your army, because those combined army units can be airlifted. Whereas in Civ 4, if you airlift, like, ten guys in a late game stack, that's it's peanuts. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the ways that I would like to have seen airports uh, and airlifting work instead is instead of limiting you to one unit uh, per airport per turn, I would have rather lift that restriction, but each airlift like consumes an oil uh, and then also, you know, contributes to uh, carbon emissions. So you have to spend a resource to ship them. Yeah, but then nobody would do it. Practice, most likely. Yeah, because a lot of times when you have a bunch of units, you're running on a very thin margin with the oil. So well, I don't know. And but it makes sense because you need the. I like to conquer a lot, so I, I tend to have more stuff. Well, it's also something that makes sense because you need the oil to power the airplanes too. I mean, if an airplane unit needs an oil, then surely a giant airliner shipping an entire army overseas needs some oil as well. I would certainly go for that if the uh, infantry stopped costing it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I- infantry should not cost in oil. Like if yes. they were mechanized infantry, then maybe yeah. sure. But I can understand it then. I, I just don't like that they cost the same as a tank. Yeah, this is why yeah, I they, missed the rubber resource from Civ Four. Yeah, it did always seem weird that the foot wa- walking around infantry costs oil. It's like, okay, yeah, they have to have maintenance on things and some of their support stuff, but yeah, it shouldn't be the full resource. Like maybe. And why oil specifically? Yeah. Because there's no food resource. Well, I mean, yeah. you you need other things to support infantry. They could have just left it at night, or even that would have been more reasonable than oil. Hey, I, I would be interested to see a design of Civ Six that has food and water as strategic resources that uh, are where your units require them for maintenance. That could be interesting. Trying to starve the enemy armies. Yeah. It would also make it harder with the AI for it to spam cities that are either out in the middle of nowhere in the desert or up on the ice caps. You know, ice caps would be a food problem. The deserts would be a water problem. Being yeah, and it would be a Civ game, though. Right. And if that food and water is necessary to, you know, feed your army in addition to the population in the cities, that does become a much bigger concern. It would be hard to do it right, though, especially because Civ covers yeah. a long period of history. Yeah, which is probably why they've never tried it. Yeah. But yeah, why I don't get why infantry requires oil. Ugh. They wanted to have some sort of a strategic resource cost, but they picked oil instead of like, like Phil was saying, like niter or something. But I don't. I don't get why they think it needs a resource, strategic resource cost. It's infantry. Like, it's the. Well, your earlier ones all do. Starting with swordsmen, you, you need something the whole way. And they probably wanted to cap the amount of them you could produce. Well, I don't know. Then I guess they, they needed. Uh, I, I mean, I'm thinking more along the lines of like warriors and spearmen and pikemen and stuff like that that didn't need resources. But yeah, I mean, I guess you're right. They All of the frontline infantry units in the game do require a st- strategic resource so it's consistent in that regard hmm. yeah. i i kind of prefer like oil is the play it's just weird to me yeah I, I kind of prefer the design where you have like a base infantry unit that does not require a resource and then have advanced specialized units that do require resources so that that i think is one of the issues uh, about civ 6's unit balance that i very much dislike is that there is not a resourceless you know, base infantry unit that is available, you know, to everybody. Are you telling yeah. me that you do not count spears and anti tanks as an as a resourceless base infantry? Yeah, there's, a, but there's, <laughs> it's like you have warriors as the equivalent in an ancient age, and then spearmen, and then pikemen. But then we get to pike and shot, and well, but there's the, nothing. Yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, but then, like in the modern era, there's no equivalent of a resourceless thing. You right, know, well, but also, the, like to use. 
example from the ancient age, you've got warriors and you can upgrade those into swords if you've got the resource. And then you, who else can you upgrade? Pike is well, not good at anti-tank, right? Or whatever those are. I mean, the, the, the point that I'm getting at, though, is that the, the anti-cavalry yeah. unit is supposed to be a specialized unit uh, type. Uh, I mean, it, it in effect isn't because it's not very good at its specialized job in, in Civ Six. But like, I could imagine a version of the anti-cavalry line that requires a strategic resource, but is much, much, much better at being anti-cavalry. Yeah. And then you would have, you know, like a, you know, maceman or something like that as a, you know, generic resourceless infantry unit that complements the, you know, like in Civ Four, the you had the maceman and then you had the swordsman that uh, uh, specialized in attacking cities. Yeah, and, and even in Civ, the Civ War earlier, you could have warriors, but you could also have axemen, which were better, were an upgrade from your basic unit. It's like you need a you need a resourceless unit, but then an upgrade unit for Civ each. Civ War had a resourceless unit, so it's only archers, basically. But, they also, yeah. but Civ, Civ War also had a lot of units where you could have one resource or another. Like the macemen required iron, iron or copper. So, you know, you could either make bronze maces or you could make steel maces. For maces, yes. There were and some that had to, it had to be iron. Swords had to have iron. Crossbows did. Knights did as well. Right, but the, but the, um, the anti-melee line, the axemen and the macemen, w- were both, I think, required one or the other. So it was a lot easier, you know, to have one of those resources or the other. Like, copper was pretty widely distributed around the map, so it wasn't hard to get it. Oh, but you needed iron for pikes, and pikes were one of the few things that even kind of sort of held up in the field against knights. Yeah, well then, I mean, I I guess it's, should every unit require a strategic resource, or uh, should only some of them? Like, I guess that's a a big design question. Yeah, I don't know, especially because some of these metals were just not that hard to come by historically, that it was a problem. Or alternatively, have advanced units require multiple resources. Like, okay, so my swordsman requires a little bit of iron, but then if I want to build a knight, I need both iron and horses. And then later in the game, like, okay, well, maybe my infantry requires oil, but my tanks require oil and steel or oil and aluminum. And then, you know, in that case, uh, iron and oil would be, you know, very widely distributed, but then you'd have those more specialized resources that are harder to come by for building the more advanced units. And then you just pillage the stuff and the AI can't fight anymore. Anyway, I forgot what we were supposed to be talking about. <laughs> well, we kind of went out in the weeds. <laughs> okay, the, t- the discussion, the topics are really more like guidelines anyway. Borders are more like guidelines, really. But I think we can uh, safely wrap up. Okay, well, in that case, I will take us to the exit. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on podcast episode 396. I am the main team, and I was joined by Canis Albinus. I hate pharmacies. Makalua. Brain blank. Insert more caffeine. And Mega Bears fan. As opposed to unsafely wrapping up? How? No, not going to go there. I wanted to throw in a way to more, throw more shade on the malls. Civilization. Oh, maybe, oh, go ahead. I was just say, well, they become obsolete two texts later. Exactly. When online shopping is invented. The internet obsolete's mall. Well, the mall's obsolete in the sales by being overbuilt in real life, but anyway. Civilization 3, 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6, Sound Clips, Copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright the Polycast at thepolycast.net.